by your Holy Spirit that we may hear what your word speaks. Amen. Amen. We've had a week now to kind of sit and let last week linger and swirl around. Any thoughts? No swirly thoughts. I was just thinking the more I read it, it, it feels like an alarm clock, like a wake up call. It feels less scary the more times we go over it and more just shaking, trying to shake people to their core and wake them up. Bingo, I'm done here. <laughs> I, I think you're making it very easily easy to understand. And I think it is explaining your explanations are really helping me to understand what, what the Bible is saying. Yeah, well, thank you. Yes, thank you. I would agree. That's my feeling too, Helen. Thank you for saying that. And Hulda, um, I, I've always been very intimidated by the book of Revelation. I've had, you know, people using it in the wrong way and to scare people. And a wake up call is a much better description, I think. I mean, so far, I'm kind of getting it. Um, so thank you, Basil. It, this has been really, really, really good. Oh, good. Then it's working. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start off a little bit differently today. Um, it's not often that I paraphrase or use Edgar Allan Poe in Bible study. I, I kind of see them as two different things. But he wrote a short story called A Descent into the Maelstrom. And the story is about two brothers who were on a ship and they were caught in a giant whirlpool. And as they're spinning around, they have two different reactions. One brother is just clinging to an iron loop on the ship and he's watching as all of the debris and everything is floating by and he is scared to death. The other brother is in the back of the boat and he's just kind of hanging on to a cask or a barrel. And the barrel's lashed down to the boat and he's just hanging onto it and watching. He starts to observe what's going on around him. And as they're spinning around and going further and further down, what he starts to realize is there are certain objects that aren't getting sucked down. And they're all cylindrical. They're like barrels that are still staying put. And so he talks to his brother and says, come on, hang on to this barrel. Let's cut loose and go. And his brother can't do it, but he does. He lashes himself to that barrel, cuts it loose, and rides out the storm. As the ship goes down and is lost, he kind of floats to the surface and floats on, and he lives to tell the tale. And as I've said all along, this, this book, life in general, can be kind of scary. And I've said what we have to cling to is that promise at the end that when we get to the end of it, Jesus wins. Let Jesus be that barrel that we're going to hang on to and just kind of ride it out. Observe what the book is saying. Observe what the world is going through. But don't be so petrified or so afraid of it that you lose sight of the way out of it all. And, and that's to cling tightly to Christ. Because we're going to get into some interesting stuff. I don't want us to get bogged down in all of the details because we miss the bigger picture. We'll go over and we'll, we'll talk about the things that are really important. But people have spent their lifetimes trying to parse this out trying to look at all of these different things and trying to line them up with current events, trying to line up with historical events, trying to line them up to what somebody else has said about this. I like to take a, a more direct approach and let's say, let's see what John is saying. Let's see what scripture is saying about the things that John is experiencing. Last week, it was suggested that I let you guys read. So I need a volunteer now to read verses one through six of chapter four. Don't everybody jump at once. <laughs> Susan. <laughs> okay, I'm using an old 
uh, revised standard version. It's not okay. It's the old one. And you want just one through six? One through six, please. Okay. After this, I looked, and lo, in heaven, an open door. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up hither, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and lo, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there appeared like Jasper and Carnelian, and round the throne was a rainbow that looked like an emerald. Round the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clad in white garments with golden crowns upon their heads. From the throne issue flashes of lightning, from the throne issue flashes of lightning in voices and peals of thunder. And before the throne burn seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne is as it were a sea of glass like crystal. Clear as mud, right? <laughs> Here's what's happening. John is getting a vision. He's getting a vision of the throne room of God. Previously, he'd been seeing Christ, the resurrected Christ in heaven. And now he's seeing God himself. And he was told to come up here. He's, he's coming up here. He's in this exalted spiritual state. And he's going through that door to see what it is he's supposed to see. And the voice, like the trumpet, says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. It's what's to come. It's this glimpse, if you will, of history. And remember, when we talk about prophecy, try to envision driving towards a mountain range. When you're far away, it looks like those mountains are right on top of each other, right? And the closer you get, you realize that there is a distance between them. And you get to that first mountain and you look and the next one's 20, 30 miles away. But from the distance, it looks compressed. And so when we're talking about prophecy, time is kind of irrelevant because it seems so compressed. And the closer you get to an event, you realize that it might be further apart. It, it could be centuries apart. It could be days, it could be minutes, it could be centuries, but time kind of supersedes the vision. Now, it's, it's difficult for us as human beings to grasp that concept because we especially like to think in linear terms. That's kind of our Western way of looking at anything as we kind of see it in linear terms. And that's been one of the downfalls of trying to interpret revelation throughout the ages is we try to see it as a linear progression of this event follows, this event follows, this event follows, this event follows, this event. And that's not always the case. We look at John's gospel. John's gospel does not follow chronological order. Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of start at the beginning of the life of Jesus and his ministry and goes up to the end. John kind of lumps his more in theological terms. He's painting a deeper picture of Jesus in his life and his ministry. And he doesn't necessarily always follow in order. And once we can understand that about John's style and how, how he writes, it, it makes this seem perfectly logical. He sees this throne with someone sitting on it. That idea of God sitting on a throne permeates scripture, especially in the Old Testament. We get these glimpses of these images of God on a throne. Now, what I find is fascinating here 
is John does not try to describe what God looks like. Ezekiel called him the ancient of days. Basically, that's where you get this image of God as an old man with a big beard and the white robe. Um, instead, John tries to describe what he's experiencing. He's not going to try to give us a detailed description. You know, he's not telling us what kind of shoes he wore and, you know, what he had in his hand for lunch or whatever. He's, he's showing us something that's beyond his ability to really understand and explain. So he talks about having this appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and a rainbow resembling, you know, an emerald. You know, he's, he's talking about the, the overwhelming awe and beauty and presence of God. And I, yes, ma'am, Catherine. Yes, <clears throat> in my footnotes, it says, um... Since God dwells in unapproachable light and is one whom no one has seen or can see, he is described in terms of the reflected brilliance of precious stones. Yep. I thought that was interesting. That's pretty much what he's trying to do. Um, so when, when we hear these descriptions, keep that explanation in mind. It's not necessarily that God is covered in precious stones. It's just that reflection, that light, that, that sheer presence. In the Old Testament, we, we see this. The Israelites were led by a pillar of fire through the night. God in that brilliant light. Inside the temple, inside the tabernacle, as I called it, the Shekinah glory, that just overwhelming light that represented the presence of God. And so when, when you think of that, think of all of these beautiful images and beautiful stones and crystal and all of those things reflecting all of that light. That's what John is seeing. And that's what he's trying to describe. I think it's actually kind of neat. <laughs> he also sees coming from the throne these flashes of lightning and peals of thunder. Again, an, another Old Testament image. When Moses was approaching Mount Sinai, Imagine a volcano erupting. You had all of the smoke, the fire, the earthquake, this rumbling, the, the lightning and everything. That's what Moses saw. That's what the Israelites saw. Can you see why they'd be a little afraid of that God of the Old Testament, that, that vision of God? John, on the other hand, doesn't seem to be phased by it. The Jews in the Old Testament in that period didn't quite understand what it was they were seeing. John understood what he was seeing. He was seeing the presence of God. And he wasn't afraid. I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Because sometimes we, we get afraid of God. Oops, I've just lost people. Okay, there we go. We become afraid of God. Now, there's, there's difference than having an awe and a, a healthy reverence for God. But we don't need to tremble in fear when we're in the presence of our Lord. That's kind of one of the reasons why Jesus had to come in the form he came in. You know, it's God with flesh on. It's, it's somebody we can relate to. It takes that fear away. And that's really John's purpose through this entire book. Don't be afraid 
of what it is you're going to hear, what it is you're going to see, what it is you're going to go through. Because the God of the universe is the one who's in control of all of this. Sometimes it seems like the world is spinning godlessly out of control. But at the end of it all, behind the scenes, God is still there. The powerful God of thunder and lightning and peals of thunder and all of that is still God. And when John is in that presence, he's amazed. He sees the, the seven lampstands again, the, the spirits of God. We're going to see the spirit of God show up several times through all of this. When he got that image of Jesus in the first three chapters, you know, he's walking among the lampstands representing the seven spirits of God. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit is inseparable from the presence of God the Father and God the Son. Sometimes we forget that. Now, coming from a, a Lutheran background, it was always kind of a funny thing for me as you would have God the Father, God the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit that we didn't talk about because we didn't understand. <laughs> and that, sadly, is how so many Christians view the role of the Holy Spirit. We either go off the deep end and start worshiping the Spirit and forget about the Father and the Son, or we focus on the Father and Son, we forget about the Spirit. But what we see in Revelation, especially early on here, is that the Spirit and the Father and the Son are inseparable. He sees this sea of glass that looks like crystal. Now, there's so many different explanations for that. You know, it's we use the term the glass ceiling today where Women in the workplace can only go so high and they can't penetrate that glass ceiling to get up to the upper levels. And some people see that that's God. He's got this separation between himself and his creation. Others see it as this in, inapproachable sea that you can't walk on to get to the throne. I kind of take a more simplistic approach. It goes with the, the beauty of the jewels and the sapphire, and you've got the lamps there, and you've got the sea, the glass. It's just this reflective, as Catherine's saying, this, this reflection of the light and the glory that John encounters. Sometimes we try to read too much into it. And that's going to be my goal through this whole section here is let's not get so wound up on what all of these things mean. Because there's explanation after explanation after explanation that will take each one of these things we're going to talk about and take you off on a tangent. But I want to try to keep it focused. So who would like to read from that point on to the end of the chapter? Peter. Um, before I start reading, I just wanted to share a footnote in uh, my Revised Standard Version that talks about um, the significance of the 24 um, thrones. Uh, the footnote says um, that they are to represent the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament and the 12 apostles of the New Testament. And I, I, that would never have occurred to me without the footnote. So that was interesting. And that's one of the things we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a second. Okay. Um, oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I didn't um, want to so overwhelm the first section, but I, I want to bring that up in this next section here. So go ahead, in the center around the throne, take it from there. All righty. Um, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion, 
the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all round and within, and day and night they never cease to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne singing, worthy art thou our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for thou didst create all things and by thy will they existed and were created. Thank you. Thank you. We've got the inner, yes, Helen. Um, from what I understand, and I may be wrong, the four living creatures represent the four gospel writers. Is that correct? Um, hold that thought. Okay. Hold that thought. Um, this is one of those places where people tend to get bogged down in details. We've got two different groups that we're talking about. We've got these 24 elders seated in white with gold crowns around the throne. And we've got these four living creatures. Now, throughout the ages, there have been so many different interpretations of what those mean. I'm gonna kind of go down the middle of the road and tell you what I think. Now you can take it as the way you want, but we'll start with those creatures first. When we look back in the Old Testament, Isaiah and Ezekiel had similar visions. They saw these four creatures surrounding the throne. Now, the ones that Ezekiel saw, each one of them had four faces. They had the face of the lion, the face of the ox, the face of an eagle, and the face of man. Here, John sees four distinct ones that each have a different face. And they're covered with eyes, and they have these wings. And Ezekiel saw a different number of wings, but the classical interpretation is the one that I want to kind of stick to, that these represent created angelic beings. The eyes represent the all-seeing. The wings represent the swiftness which they carry out God's will and judgment throughout the world. They see all, they can be everywhere. They go, it's that whole idea of God is all knowing and God is omnipresent. Now we, we've taken those over the years to look at those faces and say, okay, one represents Matthew, one rep represents Mark, one represents Luke and one represents John. It's, it's, it's really neat imagery. But I like to keep it simple. The purpose of these beings is A, to, to carry out that judgment and, and bring that message, but B, as we see with the elders, they're to worship God. Heaven is filled with the heavenly host, we call them. These created beings, these angels who are created to worship God. And I see those 24 elders as the same thing. Some people will say they represent the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel, and they're brought together as the Old Testament church, the New Testament church. Um, it's not reflected anywhere in the rest of the story. In fact, what we're going to see is that they serve the purpose of bringing the bowls of incense, which represent the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the church. They're the ones interceding between God 
and man. We pray, they bring those prayers to God. That's the role of the angel. And we'll, we'll see that a little bit more down the road. But that's kind of where we want to stay because if we start to look at, okay, which one is Matthew? That's changed over the years. <laughs> which one is Mark? That's changed over the years. Um, people throughout the ages have tried, in the Bible here, um, have tried to make this, I guess, deeper than it's meant to be. And that's one of the reasons why we, we kind of get messed up on this, is we try to read a little too much into it. Now, I'm not going to say that they're wrong. Because they truly are trying, just like John, to take the unknowable, the unimaginable, and put it in terms that we can understand. But try to envision that you've got this throne, and around that throne are all of these beings that are there to worship God. Because that's what they're doing. They're never, excuse me, never stop saying this, never ending song of praise. Now, personally, I think that would get a little old, <laughs> just constantly praising God, but I'm not in his presence. And if I were in the presence of God, I would probably have a totally different viewpoint. But Diane, you had a question, comment? Right. Um, on those songs of praise, a lot of them remind me of our service music, a lot of liturgical. And so yeah. I'm wondering, was Revelation the source of that, or are these be tied back to other things previously that from which we've derived our service? Some of the a little bit of both. Okay. A little bit of both. Historically, the church has looked at scripture to find our inspiration for the liturgy. And some of that is taken directly from Revelation. Others are taken, pulled out of some of the Psalms. Um, remember that the Psalms were really written as a hymnal. Mm -hmm. They were really meant to be sung in worship. Yeah, Diane. I didn't have anything more to say. Okay. Um, so, yeah. It's nothing new. That's what's so grounding about worship and liturgy in general. It's nothing new. It links us to the church in the past. It ties us to the church in the present. And it also ties us to the church down the road. It's kind of cool that way. Hmm, imagine that. God knew what he was doing and how to worship him. I mean, he created up this whole system for these beings to be in his presence and to worship him. You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, they were created and have their being. To me, that's one of the most powerful statements in all of scripture. By God's will, we've been created and we have our being. Susan? I have a footnote on that um, line. Uh, 11, which says they existed in God's mind from all eternity. Yeah. Yeah. Think about that. It's like Jeremiah, before you formed me in the womb, you knew me. Yeah. We're not just these random collections of genetic material that shows up in the form of history. We have a purpose. We were created by God, and in him we have our being. It's not random happenstance that we are here. 
the more that we can cling to that, the greater strength we have to face whatever life throws our way. Now, there's going to be moments of doubt and questioning and worry and wonder and why is this happening to me and or people that I love and care about. That's called being human <laughs> because we're created with those very real emotions. That's what's going on in our heads. But in our heart, in our soul, in the core of our being, we know, we know that we have our being in God. That's that barrel that we hang on to as the world is spinning around and we're going through that whirlpool. We hang on to that knowing that we have our very being rooted in God. The God who's sitting on the throne, surrounded by all these angels worshiping him, the God that has the thunder and the lightning and the peals and all of that. That's who we have as our, our anchor, our God, our rock. That should give us hope. That should give us strength. And in those times of darkness, that should give us clarity. There's a reason why the church has used some of these words in liturgy. We might not think of it as the time, but think about that. We, we sing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. When we say that, when we sing that, Yes, on the surface, we're in the moment. And sometimes we don't even think of the words as they're coming out of our mouth. But in here, they're resonating. They are reminding us who we are and who God is and that we are linked together. I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Ah, now it gets really fun. You think that was confusing. <laughs> um, who would like to read in chapter five, verses one through five? Helen? Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne, a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel pro proclaiming that with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or, its, or look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scrolls or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the book of David has conquered so that he can open the scrolls and the seven seals. Thank you, thank you. Now we get down to some of the nitty gritty details of all of this. Seated on the throne in his right hand, John sees a scroll. Now, we have books. Back in those days, you would write things on a scroll. Like think of parchment. And the parchment would be laid end to end and adhered together, and you would write stuff. Normally, you would only write it on one side. This was written on both sides. It signifies that that writing on one side and on the other side is of utmost importance. And then it was sealed. When, when you would write something down, 
and you wanted it to be delivered and you didn't want anybody else to read it, you would roll it up and you would take some wax and put on there and every, every ruler leader had their signet ring that had their initials or their sign on it and they would stamp it onto that rack, uh, onto that wax. And it could only be opened by the person it was given to. Well, there were seven seals on that. Each one of those seals as it's opened is going to be part of a revelation of what's to come. Break the first seal, read a little bit. Break the second seal, read a little bit. Break the third seal, read all the way up. Um, when we get to the sixth seal, things change. The sixth is the final seal of all of this that's going to come. And then the seventh seal, when that's broken and starts to open, that's where it really hits the fan. That's kind of the beginning of the end. All of these other things that we're going to see is, remember I've talked about this being like a whirlpool? It's not linear. It's not happening right after one another. These are the things that historically have been going down throughout the ages. It's kind of like we're setting the tone for what's to come. But John's a little concerned because he sees this and he knows it's important and nobody can open that scroll. There's nobody worthy on heaven or earth. Not even all of those angels who are there worshiping God can open that scroll. And there's only one. And that angel says, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed and he is able to open the scroll. This is that Old Testament language talking about the Messiah, the line of Judah, the root of David. He's the one who's able to open it. Who would like to read from there through verse 10? Marilyn? I can't. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm reading from the New American Standard, so 6 through 10. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb, standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came, and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he... When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. For thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Thank you. Who's John seeing here? Any thoughts? Jesus. 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 <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. But notice he's not a lion. That lion of Judah, he's a lamb. The lamb that was slain. This is linking that Old Testament to the New Testament and realizing that they are really one and the same. It's a continuation. Some people will see a very distinct delineation between the old and the new. It's really just a continuation of the same story. The people in the Old Testament days were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for that lion of Judah, the one who's going to ride in on the white horse and kick out the Romans and, and set up world to be good. That wasn't who Jesus was. 
that's who he will be. But that's not who he was when he came. He came as the lamb. We see that reflected a couple of different places in the Old Testament. You know, Isaiah talked about the lamb being led to slaughter. Psalms reflect this idea of the meek, the bruised, the battered, the broken. But here in heaven, it's that slain lamb who is the only one that's worthy to open that scroll. That, that scroll is going to talk about what is to come, what's happened and what's to come. This whole, think of especially those first six seals as really talking about all of human history. And how Jesus, being the only one who can open those scrolls, is really the one who's in charge or controls all of human history. What was to come, what is present, and what was happened in the past. It's all, all there in the control of Christ. And I love that the Jesus that John saw early on, you know, the guy with the sword coming out of his mouth and the feet like burnished bronze and the eyes of fire <laughs> is now a lamb. The lamb that was slain, that Passover lamb. That story of Passover is powerful, especially as we lay it on top of the Easter story about how it's through the blood of the lamb that's painted over the doorpost and on the frame. That's what allowed those people on the other side of that door to live as the angel of death came through Egypt. It's the same with us. It's that blood of Christ that's painted on our hearts and allows us to live in the midst of death and dying and decay and all of the yucky stuff that world throws our way. And so for John to see that lamb coming from a good Jewish background, he's gonna instantly make that connection that, that this is the Passover lamb that was slain. Now, this is, this is one of those places I'm going to get off on a tiny tangent here, but it kind of gives us a little, little ammunition because so many people say they want to take the book of Revelation literally. They, they're the ones who kind of tend to go point A to point B and point C and beyond. They see it in a linear fashion. And whenever I hear people going off on that road, I just kind of nod and smile and, you know, they're naming all of these literal things. And I'll pause and say, Let, let's, let's go back to John's vision. Did he really see a lamb with four hooves covered in wool bleeding? <laughs> or was this symbolic of the slain and resurrected Christ? And if they're going to be intellectually honest, they will say it's symbolic of the slain and resurrected Christ. And there's your opening to say, so some of this is symbolic. <laughs> Doesn't all have to be literal. Well, <laughs> but just have that in the back of your mind that if we try to take it too literally, we miss the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that it's not a literal lamb with seven horns. It's, those seven horns, again, represent the spirit of God that was sent into the world through Christ, through the redemptive work of Jesus, through the church that followed, the spirit of God is in the world today. That's what John is seeing. That's what John is saying. And he's saying that it's only because of what he has done 
that we're able to go forward. And I'm going to have to stop here today because that's, we're, we're out of time. <laughs> yes, Susan. I have a footnote about the seven horns and the seven eyes, and it says it's the plentitude of power and insight. So the seven horns are representing power and the seven eyes representing insight. Yep. Anybody else have anything? Easy crowd today. <laughs> Vita. I really like um, how you are keeping a focus in a, a, a kind of a consistent direction, you know, and not getting off on tangents or, or just pointing out that some people have, and, you know, this is where they arrived and that lets us continue on this path for now. And that's making it much. Um, less intimidating for me, I hope, um, you know, it's proving true for the rest of the group as well, but I, I appreciate that uh, perspective. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> trying to keep us focused on the thing that truly matters. Hold on. Um, it's kind of reminding me of baptismal covenant, um, some of the language and being marked as Christ's own forever and Tying yep. that into the lamb and the blood. Um, yep. I just thought that was an interesting connection. It all kind of links together, doesn't it? So some of the stuff that we've done throughout the ages of the church actually has a grounding to it. It actually kind of makes sense when we stop and look at it like that. So thanks. Anybody else? That's all I got, folks. Until next week. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. You're welcome. Have a blessed week. You, see you. too. See you in church on Sunday. <laughs> yep. <laughs>